Um, I'm going to get straight into this. Uh, there were three diseases affecting the minds and bodies of those who sailed the remoter parts of the Pacific and Indian Oceans during the four centuries separating Magellan from uh, Scott of the Antarctic. And these diseases were nostalgia proper, scorbutic nostalgia, and calenture or sea fever. Their symptoms were often confusingly alike because they cohered around powerfully attractive images of land and its viewable and edible products to which the patient became addicted or even enslaved. And those, those suffering from nostalgia were troubled by an immovable image of home, generally uh, a rural setting associated with childhood, to which all other concerns became secondary. Towards the end of Cook's Endeavour voyage, Banks noticed in the Arafura Sea that with the exceptions of himself, Daniel Solander and Cook, the whole ship was affected with nostalgia. And a few days later, thinking of Dampier's voyage across the same sea, he um, succumbed himself to the disease. Home recurred to my mind, he said, stronger than it had done throughout the whole voyage. In most reports of nostalgia, the tyranny of the imagined sights, tastes, and sounds of home was constant and increasingly peremptory, uh, to the degree that all foreign things became odious in comparison with the grand desideratum of native soil, which, if not supplied, it was generally said, would end in death, and often did. In the latter stages of nostalgia, intense melancholy was often accompanied by starvation because foreign food would be refused, absolutely refused. Um, and starvation, with its attendant sim sim symptoms of syncope, lassitude, poor circulation and stupor, would supervene. But these later physical signs of nostalgia um, are the only clinical evidence of its presence. Otherwise it is, as Johannes Hofer, the Swiss Doctor who first invented the term nostalgia pointed out, entirely the result of an afflicted imagination. Scorbutic nostalgia, on the other hand, originated with the effects of a poor diet, chiefly affecting sailors on long, long voyages. Without fresh vegetables and fruit, the levels of ascorbic or vitamin C in their bodies fell to dangerously low levels. Ascorbic acid is, as you know, an antioxidant, one of whose major contributions to the health of mind and body is to scavenge free radicals from the synapses. When this fails to occur, oxidative stress affects the performance of the neurotransmitters, resulting in lassitude and stupor that nevertheless is interspersed with powerful phantom sensations and extremely vivid, vivid images of what the body needs, such as fruit, vegetables, and fresh water. These visions were described by Thomas Trotter, to whom we are indebted for the name as well as the etiology of this particular form of nostalgia. Of his patients, he reported, the cravings of appetite not only amuse their waking hours with thoughts of green fields and streams of pure water, but in dreams they are tantalized by the favorite ideas and on waking, the mortifying disappointment is expressed with the utmost regret, with groans and weeping, altogether childish. And he added, I consider these longings as the first symptoms of constant attendance of the disease in all its stages. It seems as if the images of the land and its products raised by scurvy differed very little from the scenes of home entertained by the Swiss soldiers described in Hofer's treatise, um, Nostalgia. Um, but it is equally clear that these images provoke dietary problems in the case of nostalgia proper, while the visions of scorbutic nostalgia flow from a nutritional crisis at the outset of the disease. James Lind wrote of scorbutic sailors, what nature from an inward feeling makes them thus strongly desire, constant experience confirms to be the most certain prevention and best cure of their disease. So there is a clinical element throughout scorbutic nostalgia, which there isn't in um, nostalgia proper. As for calenture, it was summarily just defined by uh, Johnson in his dictionary as a distemper in hot climates wherein sailors imagine the sea to be green fields. 
Um, this moment of misrecognition was often followed by a fatal second step when the deluded mariner would fling himself overboard in an effort to enjoy the delightful prospect. The disturbance of the brain, this disturbance of the brain called Callinger has a lively literary pedigree stretching back as far as the Odyssey, where the sirens are the sinister guardians of the delicious plots of fant fantastic ground that are fenced with the bones of those sailors who made the fatal attempt to reach them. In the conquest of Granada, John Dryden has Almahide tell Almanzor, "'Tis but the raging calenture of love, like a distracted passenger you stand and see in seas imaginary land, cool groves and flowery meads, and whilst you sing to walk, plunge in and wonder that you sink." In his satire on the South Sea Bubble, Swift compares the deluded bankrupt with the febrile sailor who sees on the smooth ocean's azure bed enameled fields and verdant trees. Wordsworth was uh, interested in this delusion and offers his fullest treatment of it in his poem Brothers, where Leonard would often hang over the vessel's side and gaze and gaze, and while the broad blue wave and sparkling foam flashed round him images and hues that wrought in union with the employment of his heart, he thus, by feverish passion, overcome, even with the organs of his bodily eye, below him in the bosom of the deep saw mountains, saw the forms of sheep that grazed on verdant hills. Medical discussions of scurvy freely associated it with calenture. In the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, abridged uh, by Henry Jones in 1721, an account of the prodigious scurvy of Paris, 1699, sits next door to an account of Calenture. Ephraim Chambers uh, excerpts the latter for his Cyclopedia, confirming that Calenture is a delusion wherein the patients imagine the sea to be green fields and, if not prevented, will leap overboard, being so eager to get to their imaginary cool verdure. In Zoonomia, Erasmus Darwin sees little difference between calenture and nostalgia, offering a definition that will do for both. He calls it an unconquerable desire of returning to one's native country frequent in long voyages, in which the patients become so insane as to throw themselves into the sea, mistaking it for green fields or meadows. More recently, Jean Starobansky has cited Darwin as his authority for treating calenture as the nautical variant of nostalgia. In his play, The Two Foscari, Byron presents Calenture, that malady which calls up green and native fields to view from the rough deep with such identity to the poor exile's, fe exile's fevered eye that he can scarcely be restrained from treading them. He calls them up, uh, I say, as an allegorical representation of the fatal outcome of nostalgia, which, he says, collects such pasture for the longing sorrow that the victim feeds on the sweet but poisonous thought and dies. Yet it's observable in several accounts of Calenture that home is the last thing that the impetuous maritime pastoralist is interested in. Let the sailor but hear the call, says Homer, let the sailor but hear the call of any siren he will so despise both wife and children for their sorceries that never home turns his affection stream. And Trotter noticed that for all their tearful yearnings for green fields, his patients sometimes forgot all old attachments, showing utmost signs of dislike to those who had been most dear. When Wordsworth's Leonard gets back to the rural scenes he saw pictured in the bosom of the deep, he finds it a place in which he could not bear to live. Recently, Joyce Chaplin has interpreted Calenture along with scurvy as earth sickness a somatic revolt mounted specifically against the sea, rather than, as Kevis Goodman has recently suggested of nostalgia, travel as such. Earth sickness expresses itself in disgust with the ocean and in an urge to return to what Chaplin calls a whole body experience of the whole earth. Now, how far the whole earth can exclude two thirds of its surface and still be consistent with what Chaplin calls humanity's secular self-awareness on a planetary scale she leaves unclear, but presumably the converting imagination of Calenture 
turns all the sea to earth in one plenary metamorphosis. And this broader conception of the longing for land as an ecumenical passion for any kind of earth, mal de terre, rather than the longing for home, maladie du pays, is useful in several accounts of character, for it embraces the extremes of febrile violence to which it sometimes tends, as well as the more sedate and meditative, meditative engagements with the surface or the depth of the ocean. Kenon Digby described the extravagance of the violent counterist, but that which of all others seemed to cause most compassion. So this was, his, this was in the, his, his, on his trip, his uh, expedition to the Mediterranean. Uh, what seemed to cause most compassion was the furious madness of most of those who were near their end, the sickness then taking their brain, and those who were in so great abundance that they were, there were scarce men enough to keep them from running overboard or from, from cre keep creeping out of the ports, the extreme heat of the disease being such that they desired all refreshments, and their depraved fantasy made them believe the sea to be a spacious and pleasant green meadow. Melville, on the other hand, in Moby Dick, shows how seductively Kalancher engages the senses and the imagination. These are the times when in his whale boat the rover softly feels a certain filial, confident, land-like feeling towards the sea, that he regards it as so much flowery earth, and the distant ship, revealing only the tops of her masts, seems struggling forward not through high rolling waves, but through the tall grass of a rolling prairie. The long-drawn virgin veils, the mild blue hillsides, as over these there steals the hush, the hum. You almost swear that play-weary children lie sleeping in these solitudes, some glad Maytime when the flowers of the woods are plucked. And all this mixes with your most mystic mood, so that fact and fancy halfway meeting interpenetrate and form one seamless whole. What is it then that marks the point of difference between these three diseases which share an identical vision, apparently identical vision, of vegetable nature? Well, I think somatic, somatic provides a useful standard for it distinguishes the clinical importance of scorbutic cravings from the purely imaginary reveries of nostalgia. As for Kalancher, it may seem to be a delusion of the brain, but it has organic possibilities too. Um, I consider, just for a moment, the uh, episode of the Lotus Eaters in the Odyssey as a set piece in which nostalgia, scorbutic nostalgia, and calenture each stake a claim. As Odysseus herds his crew from the meadow where they've been feeling so voluptuous, or voluptuously on the delicious fruits of the jujube bush, we're told they strived and wept and would not leave their meat for heaven itself. Odysseus's motto is, nothing so sweet as is our country's earth. But his men disagree, because as they feed, they did quite forget, as all men else that did but taste their feast, both countrymen and country. So he drags them away to disappointments more worthy of true patriots. And it's a question whether the tears of men torn from their food are calentural or scorbutic, uh, and whether Odysseus, in pre preventing them, uh, from eating any more is acting out of sheer nostalgia. And I'd be inclined to compare the lotus eaters with the sailors of Anson's uh, centurion, who wept with the cravings of appetite and then found themselves charmingly su surrounded by esculent vegetables on Juan Fernandez, on which they gorged themselves back to health. However, if lotus eating is an intoxicated engagement with what is sheerly antithetic to ships and sea, the ecumenical fruit of the earth, as Chaplin would call it, then it fits the model of calenture that she has outlined. A lot of sailors and physicians believe that the smell alone of freshly turned earth or of plants had a curative value, in which case scurvy and calenture are directing semen to a similar, although not identical, cure. And if Odysseus stands as an exemplar of homesickness, then he follows the pattern of those afflicted with nostalgia, for whom homecoming is a disappointed end. Because when he gets back to Ithaca, he doesn't know where he is. He can't recognize home. And uh, this happens to lots of people suffering from nostalgia. In fact, Kant says for definite in the anthropology 
that there is uh, there is no <coughs> real cure in um, in nostalgia, no cure in sending nostalgists back home uh, because they're always going to be disappointed. But he reckons that is the cure. Uh, they get rid of their fantasy that way. Um, well, I want to pause uh, just for a moment on the difference between Calancho and Scorpion and nostalgia, which will become important a bit later. Um, uh, a, a difference that was important to two 17th century physicians fascinated by scurvy, Thomas Willis and Walter Charlton. They were aware that what is enjoyed by the scorbutic sailor is the coincidence of an idea of satisfied desire, the dream of fruits and vegetables, and the sensation of actually satisfying that appetite. That moment of reflective ecstasy was generally not available to the victim of calenture or, of course, that the victim of nostalgia, who was never going to enjoy him or herself at all. Um, Charlton calls it um, corroboration when the notion of what is so powerfully desired is greeted by the sensation uh, of its arrival and then redoubled by the energy of the animal spirits. Whole brigades of them, he says, dispatched into the organs of the senses and into all the muscles. Willis explained drinking a long anticipated fine wine in this way of corroboration. He says, the imagination of its pleasure is again sharpened by the taste and then by a reflected appetite drinking is repeated. So, as it were, in a circle, the throat or appetite provokes the sensation and the sensation causes the appetite to be sharpened and iterated. The literature of Scope is filled with accounts of this ecstatic encounter with the idea and the sensation, or the coincidence of the idea and the sensation of physical satisfaction. Trotter recalled, the patient in the inveterate stage of the disease seems to gather strength even from the sight of the fruit. The spirits are exhilarated by the taste itself, and the juice is swallowed with the motions of the most voluptuous luxury. There's a scene from Ovid's Metamorphoses in which something like lotus eating and calenture sit at the center, but in, an, in a reversed position. It's a story told by Glaucus, who sits on a grassy bank. You see him up there. I mean, sat down there. Uh, uh, he's, 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 he's given up his grassy bank by this time to become a fishy lover. Um, and he's telling um, Scylla how when he fished, uh, his, the, the, his catch began to nibble at the grass and start moving about. Um, had some god, god done it, or was it the grass's juice? Plucking some of the herbage with my hand, I chewed what I had plucked. Scarce had I swallowed the strange juices when suddenly I felt my heart trembling within me and my whole being yearn with desire for another element. Unable long to stand against it, I cried, cried, Farewell, O earth, to which I shall never more return, and I plunged into the sea. There, plunging into the sea. Um, whereupon uh, his beard turns green, his body becomes blue, and his legs are transformed into a fish's tail. So instead of mistaking the sea for land, Glaucus knows that water is the element he means to inhabit, and he gets to know this by eating the product of the land, um, grass and fresh herbs, which here he is holding in his hand triumphantly. Um, what might have been a remedy for scurvy, as perhaps the lotus fruits were, doesn't normalize um, um, Glaucus's appetite or will or focuses attention on land or home but instead commits him to the most exotic alternative whose blazon of green and blue he wears forever after the green of the grass that made him see the importance of the blue of the water well aware of the damage that coral can do to the keel of a ship Matthew Flinders gazed at the wonders of the Great Barrier Reef experiencing something like a palimpsest of a scorbutic dream and a calenturon hallucination. When he reports, we had wheat sheaves, mushrooms, stag's horns, cabbage leaves, and a variety of other forms glowing underwater with vivid tints of every shade between green, purple, brown, and white, equal in beauty and excelling in grandeur, the most favorite parterre of the curious florist. You'll notice that all but one of these so-called flowers is an edible fungus, cereal, or vegetable. 
Flinders is only looking down at the reef, is thinking of the exotic and the familiar at the same time, blurring the colours of the fantastic garden with the shapes of ordinary victuals, as if not quite sure how to orient his taste or how to determine the peril of his view of your position. But suddenly peril puts pay to the amphibian delights of the scene. He thinks again of the danger of the coral, and he moves on. While it's unlikely that there is, uh, while it's likely rather that there is often some sort of scorbutic prompt in cases of calenture, it's perfectly possible to suffer from calenture early in a voyage, well before a dietary deficiency kicks in, as melancholy or delirium. The immediate cause is staring at the sea for too long. Besides the psychological or temperamental inclination to see land where none is to be found, there is the possibility of something like hypnosis or Erasmus Darwin uh, and Wordsworth both believe this, somnambulism involved in its onset. And calenture is still a problem at sea. It was revealed by the National Union of Seamen in the United Kingdom that of 3,778 deaths recorded at sea between 1964 and 1978, 577 were most likely owing to the hallucinations of seamen staring at the ocean. In this regard, calenture belongs with those other reveries Erasmus Darwin called dis diseases of volition because they were so um, disobedient to external sympathy. I mean, they were this kind of short-circuited imagination that Hofer says is typical of nostalgia proper. But there's another cause of calenture that has nothing to do with susceptibility or mood, but simply with the function of the eye. Wordsworth puts it succinctly in The Brothers when he says that Leonard saw what he saw, even with the organ, organs of his bodily eye. It's his sensorium that's engaged, not his imagination. He's receiving impressions that have been subtly metamorphosed morphosed as the optic nerve registers the effects of light at sea. Yet those impressions are perceived as the pressure of real things and real colours upon the eye. So calenture must not necessarily be confounded with reverie, which is the category I'm saying I put nostalgia in, um, uh, because calenture's sensory excitements are, um, are in any event immediate. They're not d deferred until they disappear like nostal nostal nostalgias, nor are they redoubled by the strange excitements generated by scurvy in the neuro neuronal pathways when satisfying food comes into the possession of the patient. So, um, you know, calenture is a kind of, uh, it has unique, unique qualities and properties. Since the basic event in calenture is the chromatic shift from blue to green that fixes or is occasioned by a turning of the roll and pitch of the sea into a landscape perceived either on the surface or on the sea floor. It would be useful to examine, first of all, the medical and then the scientific or aesthetic background for such an event. How colours turn into their opposites under the strain of looking at them was a mystery partly elucidated, elucidated in zoonomia in an essay on reverse optical spectra written by Erasmus Darwin's son, but probably ghosted by his father. If the eye is fatigued with staring at a single colour, it will take relief by changing it to the opposite tint on the spectrum. Blue is supplanted by green, uh, sorry, blue is supplanted by orange, red by green, violet by yellow. But how the blue of the sea changes place with the green of pasture and woodland in cases of calendar is still not clear. There are many accounts of the surface of the ocean turning red that would then yield the reverse optical spectrum of green. At Point Culver, Matthew Flinders came across a red scum composed of the tiny jointed fibres of my microorganisms. In the red shadow of the ship, the ancient mariner discovers the wonders of phosphorescence. Alternatively, the condition called tritinopia is caused by damage done by ultraviolet light to the short wavelength cones of the retina, and that's easily sustained by staring for too long at light reflected from the surface of the ocean. The eye of anyone suffering from this disease confuses pink and orange and blue and green. On the other hand, J.R. Forster, a close observer in colours and already fascinated by phosphorescence in the Southern Ocean, has a number of useful observations concerning the compounding of green in Antarctic light. 
He reports the setting sun commonly gilds all the sky and clouds near the horizon with a lively gold, yellow or orange. It is, therefore, by no means extraordinary to see at sun setting a greenish sky or cloud. I had an opportunity to observe at sun setting a beautiful green cloud. Some others at a distance were of an olive colour and even part of the sky was tinged with a lively, delicate green. Well, it wouldn't take very much for that green to be transfused to the ocean. Both Flinders and uh, William Scoresby, son of the famous whaling captain, simply saw green at sea. Flinders noticed that on the inside of the Great Barrier Reef, the water was smooth and of a light green color. Scoresby found in the uh, Arctic that on the meridian of London in 1817, uh, the sea was found to be of a blue color and transparent. It then became green and less transparent. The color was nearly grass green with a shade of black. I fell in with such narrow stripes of various colored water that we passed streams of pale green, olive green, and transparent blue in the course of 10 minutes sailing. Perhaps the most rigorous scientific account of how the sea can turn either red or green is given by Newton in the Optics, where he discusses the account of different effects of absorbed and reflected light in seawater, given by Edmund Halley, who on a bright sunshine day went underneath the ocean in a diving bell. And this is how Newton reports it. <laughs> when he was sunk many fathoms deep into the water, the upper part of his hand on which the sun shone directly through the water and through a small glass window in the vessel, appeared of a red color, like that of a damask rose. And the water below and the under part of his hand, illuminated by light reflected from the water below, looked green. For thence it may be gathered that the sea water <coughs> reflects back the violet and blue making rays most easily and lets the red making rays pass most freely and copiously to great depths. For thereby the sun's direct light at all great depths, by reason of the predominantly red making rays, must appear red, and the greater the depth is, the fuller and intenser must that red be, and at such depths as the violet making rays scarce penetrate into, the blue making, green making, and yellow making rays being reflected from below more copiously than the red making ones must compound a green. Now this suggests that a vision of watery depths would be correctly coloured crimson provided the clarity of the medium and the angle of the light allowed a human eye to penetrate so far, Homer's wine-dark sea, perhaps. Whereas the green landscape that seduces a sailor overboard is an hallucination provoked, <coughs> or possibly not an hallucination, provoked by light sent back from the surface, where blue, yellow, and green all compound as green. While Coleridge was staring at Sabah Tan, his eye, <coughs> perhaps fascinated first by its depths and then by its surface, appeared to him blood crimson and then sea green, suggesting that there are other causes besides algae and little creatures responsible for these changes in colour. Artists interested in the degrees of depth attached are artists interested in degrees of depth are attached to this palette. Compare, for instance, the artist uh, Le Sueur on um, Baudin's voyage, where he sees things near the surface like a Medusa, and then lower down. Um, um, and here are two examples um, from the series Watery Ecstatic from Ellen Gallagher's uh, show um, Axe Me, currently on at the uh, Tate Modern in London. Uh, she's an African American artist who spent uh, time at Woods Hole learning how to draw uh, oceanographic, uh, sorry, not oceanographic. Um, um, specimens from the bottom. The, what she specialised in were pteropods or wing-footed snails. Um, and she is fascinated by mixing the palette. Um, and here is a festival of all the spectral hues uh, in Philip Goss's um, illustrations to Charles Kingsley's book about the seashore aptly named Glaucus. Um, as for blue, combining with rose tints and coppery greens, try Blake's picture of Newton, which only recently somebody pointed out is under sea. Um, 
and here are um, Anna Atkins, beautiful cyanotypes from 1850, where the specimen seems to emerge from a deep blue ocean into the shallow green light of the surface. Well, the same impulse that carried Halley and Newton down to the watery depths of the ocean in search of reasons for colours carried Boyle in the same direction in search of something like landscape. In his essay, Relations About the Bottom of the Sea, he recorded uh, interviews with hydrographers and others familiar with um, the pearl fishery, who gave him some surprising commentaries on his working hypothesis that the superficies of the ground or vessel that contained the ocean should be either flat, level, or regularly concave. He was informed, to the contrary, that in diverse places the bottom was exceedingly unequal, in some places being flat, in others aspirated with crabby rocks, a considerable height, and elsewhere sinking into precipitous depths in which they found it very cold. Uh, Boy went on to suppose that these submarine configurations resembled such as we observe in the discovered part of the terrestrial globe. Um, and in arriving at this conclusion, he gave scientific uh, counterpoise to one of Gilpin's, William Gilpin's aesthetic insights uh, the next century into the analogy between the surface of the ocean and the beauties of landscape. Gilpin wrote um, in observations on the River Wye, now if the ocean in any of these swellings and agitations should be arrested and fixed, it would produce that pleasing variety which we admire in the ground. Hence it is common to fetch our images from water and apply, apply them to land. We talk of the, an undulating line, a playing lawn, and a billowy surface, and give a much stronger and more adequate idea by such imagery than plain language can possibly present. Mrs. Radcliffe's imagination sported with these possibilities when Emily St. Aubert witnesses of Venice a seaborne masquerade of Neptune and its court. She almost wished to throw off the habit of mortality and plunge into the green wave to participate them. Having fancied the calendar from above, um, Mrs. Radcliffe proceeds to handle calendar from below um, in a piece of poetry about the Xenoms. In coral bars, I love to, I love to lie and hear the surges, of the ro surges roll above and through the waters view on high the proud ships sail and gay clouds move. And here is the same angle, rather less poetically conceived, from Gustave Doré's illustrations. Yeah, I'm not sure you know. Um, um, Gustave Doré's illustrations of the ancient man. I want to end with an experiment in colour that I hope will provide some pictorial endorsements for the distinctions I've been trying to make between the futile reverie of nostalgia, the reflexive delights of scorbutic nostalgia, and the uh, chromatic variations that it is possible to play upon the theme of calenture. George Forster, J.R. Forster's son, painted a picture of icebergs in the Antarctic Ocean called Ice Islands with Ice Blick. The consensus among eyewitnesses of the event was that they were seeing an example not of ice blink, but of the southern lights mounting from the horizon to the zenith and accompanied by extensive phosphorescence. It's phosphorescence, in, uh, yeah. T together with the advent of a remarkable iceberg shaped like a pillar with a hollow in it. Um, there it is. Um, whatever phenomenon is responsible for the brightness in the distant sky to the right of the picture, it seems to be compounded with the yellow tint of evening sunlight that contrasts dramatically with the darkness advancing from the opposite side of the composition. The coalition of natural light and the aurora is responsible for the spectral alteration that invades the foreground of the picture where everything is tinged with blue except that portion of the sky from which the light streams. It's likely that its brightness, echoed by the phosphorescence in the sea and by the reflected sheen of the icebergs, fatigued George's eye as it tried to organize a scene of white shapes arranged on a blue ground, until his retina became, to quote Darwin, insensible to white light, and thence a bluish spectrum became visible on all luminous objects. And that, at any rate, is what George painted and it can stand, perhaps, as an example of blue rather than green calenture. Now, how this scene was transformed from blue to green 
makes an interesting episode in the pictorial history of Callagher and school boutique nostalgia too, since by the time George lifted his brush, scurvy had made uh, heavy inroads on the health of most people aboard the Resolution. William Hodges painted the same two icebergs that appear in George's Ice Islands with Ice Brick, the pillow with a hole in it and a sort of ruined pyramid, probably at the same time as George, only using oils instead of gouache. For reasons that aren't known, he decided when he arrived at Dusky Bay a month later to use the canvas for another picture. The original, therefore, can only be retrieved by X-ray, and here it is. The painting on top is called View in Pickersgill Harbour, a picture of domestic peace with a sailor returning to his dinner of fish after a pleasant day's angling. The warmth of the air is evident in the clothes drying on the line, and there's a little house nestling in the glade, uh, acting as the focus of these blessings, surrounded by the rich green of a temperate rainforest. Even the sea has turned green, bordered with yellow. If you place the X-ray alongside Pickersgill Harbour, you can see not only the outlines of the icebergs and the southern horizon, recognisably the same that George painted, but you also observe that the brightness of the western sun in the surface image of Pickersgill Harbour is indebted to the original thick layer of white lead paint used for the upper part of the pillar-shaped iceberg. The X-ray shows that everything strange, white and forbidding, cold and blue in the original scene was not just being overpainted, it was being transformed into its opposite in a deliberate maneuver of the artist's hand that satisfied not the longings of pure nostalgia for Dusky Bay's 14,000 miles away from, from home, nor the immediate demands of culture, for Hodge's brush is rearranging the timing of the chromatic change from blue to green uh, over a month's time, and deploying for its own purposes the effects of retinopathy and reverse optical spectra. So a view of Pickersgill Harbour is, I should like to suggest, an example of scorbutic nostalgia framed by Kalancha, where the powerful appetite for absent necessities such as warmth, food, vegetation, safety, and things coloured green, combines with the sensations of enjoying them all. It's a scene, that is to say, of what Walter Charlton would call corroboration, where the idea of enjoying something becomes mingled with the sensation of actually enjoying it a pleasure of which Hodges evidently intended the public to know only half. <laughs>